The lens that forms the image on your film emulsion is as important as the mechanical design of your camera and your skills as a cinematographer. Before you purchase a film camera that comes with a lens, fixed or interchangeable, or plan on buying a separate lens, you need to know what to look for. This video is about understanding the basics and helping you making the right choice based on what is available and within your budget. First, let's divide lenses into two categories. Zoom lenses are lenses with a variable focal length defined by the zoom range. Many modern consumer digital cameras, as well as most vintage Super 8 cameras, come with a fixed, non-interchangeable zoom lens. Good zoom lenses, appropriate for film and video, maintain focus throughout the entire zoom range. These are called parfocal lenses. Prime lenses have a fixed focal length. These tend to be simpler in design, with fewer elements and are more affordable. You don't have the flexibility of a zoom lens, but prime lenses often perform better, since they specialize in one focal length only. You can find prime lenses, for example, on most older 16mm cameras from the 1930s through 1960s. Some of these cameras have lens turrets and accept a set of three prime lenses. And of course, prime lenses continue to be used as we speak. Anamorphic lenses are a different beast altogether. I will talk about these near the end of this video. For now, let's talk about regular non-anamorphic lenses, also called spherical lenses. Each lens is tailored to a particular image size and forms an image circle. It has a specific size that covers a certain image area. You can use a lens with a smaller image size, but not with a larger one, since vignetting occurs. You need to make sure that any interchangeable lens covers the entire image area. If the lens was designed for a larger format, there is no problem at all as long as it fits the lens mount. Since many of you are probably more familiar with digital image sensor formats, here is a quick reference to get you into the ballpark. The APS-C sensor is almost the exact same as Super 35mm film. That's why it's also called Super 35 sensor. The Micro Four Thirds sensor is quite a bit larger than Super 16, but can be considered similar. Super 8 is slightly larger than a fourth of the regular 16mm image area. What specifies a lens is first and foremost its focal length, the distance from the optical center to the imaging plane. In reality, it means how much the projected image is magnified or diminished. This is called field of view or angle of view. Since a smaller image size crops the picture, the resulting field of view is narrower. To get the same field of view with different image sizes or film formats, you need to know the focal length equivalent. Let's start with what is considered the normal focal length. In photography and cinematography, normal focal length describes a lens reproducing a field of view that appears natural to an observer, exactly between a wide angle and a telephoto. While there are disagreements about the exact figures, there are numbers that have been established. Here are the focal lengths that are considered normal for each film format. For 35mm formats, it's 50mm. For 16mm and Super 16, it's 25 mm. For Super 8, it's 15 mm. Shorter focal length means a wider angle of view. Longer focal length means a narrower angle of view. Here are the focal lengths for a wide angle for each format. Again, these are ballpark figures. For 35 mm formats, it's 20 mm. For a 16 mm and Super 16, it's 10 mm. For Super 8, it's 6 mm. Keep these figures in mind because wide-angle lenses are often used in narrative films where you want to get close to the actors, shoot in tight spaces, have a deeper depth of field and more freedom for handheld shooting. Here are the ballpark figures for a longer focal length, called a telephoto. For 35mm formats, it's 150mm. For 16mm and Super 16, it's 75mm. For Super 8, it's 45mm. Many zoom lenses go even longer in focal length, but you will find yourself using these on rare occasions only. So, if you look for a set of three different prime lenses for a 35mm film camera, a typical choice would be 20mm, 50mm and 150mm. For 16mm or Super 16 film, that would be 10mm, 25mm and 75mm. 
Prime lenses are very rarely used for a Super 8, since almost all cameras come with a fixed zoom lens. Just as a reference, a typical set would be 6mm, 15mm and 45mm. I cannot overemphasize that in narrative filmmaking, independently from film format, you will almost certainly find yourself using shorter focal lengths for many shots and your actual choice may shift towards slightly shorter focal lengths. Now let's look at some examples of zoom lenses. For 35mm, remember that 50mm is the normal focal length, I will give you just the example of the great Cook zoom lenses, which include 15 to 40 mm, a wide angle through normal, and 25 to 250 mm, a moderate wide angle through telephoto. These are high end, very expensive lenses that are normally rented. For a 16 mm film, remember that 25 mm is the normal focal length. You have, for example, the Krasnogorsk 3, that comes with an interchangeable Meteor 17 to 69 mm a rather narrow zoom range, so you will need additional prime lenses, especially wide angle. The Canon Scopic with a fixed 12.5 to 75 mm zoom lens, which still doesn't go that wide, but it's very good. The classic Ingenue 12 to 120 mm lens for various cameras, which is an excellent zoom range. You might find 12 mm still not wide enough for every situation and perhaps get an additional 9.5 or 10 mm prime lens. For Super 8 film, remember that 15 mm is the normal focal length. Here, for example, these excellent cameras. The Nizo S800 with a fixed zoom lens, 7 to 80 mm, which is very good. The Canon 1014 XLS with a fixed zoom lens, 6.5 to 65 mm, which goes wider. The Beaulieu 4008 ZM2 with the interchangeable Schneider 6 to 66 mm or the Ingenue 8 to 64 mm. The Beaulieu 6008S with the interchangeable Schneider 6 to 70 mm or the Ingenue 6 to 90 mm, which is very impressive. The second most important feature of a lens is the aperture, also called the iris. The aperture restricts the amount of light traveling through the lens system. A smaller aperture also results in a sharper and more deeply focused image. The aperture is measured by the F number, known as F-stop. It is the focal length divided by the diameter of the aperture, or entrance pupil to be precise. This results in a series of numbers. The higher the number, the less light hits the film emulsion or digital sensor. Each higher number represents half the light. Here is the series of numbers of decreasing aperture. F1.4, F2, F2.8, F4, F5.6, F8, F11, F16 and F22. Most lenses have the available F numbers written on the lens. On high-end cinema lenses, the aperture ring is often declicked, allowing for a very precise aperture control and all in-between f-stops. When you read the f-stop in the specification of a lens, it means how much light the lens lets through at maximum aperture. This is also called the lens speed. A fast lens, meaning the same exposure can be achieved at a faster shutter speed or a higher frame rate if desired. So if you read, for example, f2.8, it is a reasonably fast lens, especially for longer focal lengths or zoom lenses. If you read, for example, f1.4, you have a very fast lens. High-end cinema lenses use T-stops instead of F-stops. T stands for transmission, meaning the exact amount of light, since it varies a little from different lens designs and materials. In reality, your T-stop is always very slightly higher than your F-stop, something to keep in mind. Lenses typically perform best at a certain f-stop. At the extremes, wide open or stop down, problems such as soft focus or hazy image may occur. Minimum focus distance is also important. It means how close you can get to a subject and still have it in focus. Being able to get really close to a subject, just inches away or even touching it, is called macro. Obviously, the quality of a lens is very important. Before purchasing a particular lens, you might want to look up details and opinions about it in online reviews and forums. All lenses have flaws to some degree. These are called optical aberrations. Of course, lenses of higher quality minimize these flaws. Here are some of the typical problems. Chromatic aberration. This occurs when different wavelengths are not focused to the same point, 
usually towards the edges of the frame. Barrel distortion and pincushion distortion. The former can often occur in wide-angle lenses and the latter in telephoto lenses. Field curvature. A flat object, such as a wall, cannot be brought completely into focus since the focal plane is curved. So either the center or the edges are slightly out of focus. Other optical aberrations are defocus, astigmatism, spherical aberration and coma. Some lenses have light fall off towards the edges. This falls under vignetting. Many of these problems occur towards the edges of a frame. So a lens typically performs best in a circle around the image center. If you use a lens that was designed for a larger format, you usually get a high quality image from edge to edge. Some of these aberrations can even be desirable since they give the lens a certain character. Modern computer design high-end lenses minimize these problems to the point of perhaps being sterile. This is the reason why certain vintage lenses are sought after. Yet another problem is focus breathing. This may become annoying when you want to include rack focus. If a lens has heavy focus breathing, it also zooms in or out a little when you pull focus. Different focal lengths result in a different relation between foreground and background. As a general rule, wide-angle lenses augment the distance and telephoto lenses shorten the distance and compress foreground and background. It is very important to understand that different focal lengths convey different emotions. Wide-angle lenses are great for very dynamic in-your-face shots. Subject and background are separated. These can also be used for a grotesque or comedic effect. Telephoto lenses are great for any activity being observed from a distance. Since the perspective is so compressed, it seems that people walking or running towards the camera make almost no progress. Your depth of field is also very important, especially in a narrative film. Depth of field means how near or how far away your subject can be while still remaining in acceptable focus. You can, for example, blur out the background to isolate a person or an object that is in focus. You can also blur out the foreground for the same effect, or even blur foreground and background. Changing the focus from one subject to another during a shot is called rack focus. To achieve this, you need a narrow depth of field, either by choosing a longer focal length or by opening your diaphragm, or both. You need to remember that the smaller the film format, the shorter the focal length of the lens to get the same kind of image. Since shorter focal lengths have a deeper depth of field at the same f-stop, you need to open your diaphragm and or choose a longer focal length to achieve a similar result. To open your diaphragm, you can do things like controlling the light or using an ND filter in front of your lens. ND stands for neutral density and evenly reduces light, typically by one, two or three stops. You can also have everything in focus when foreground and backgrounds are equally important. For a deep depth of field, also called deep focus, you need a shorter focal length and or to close down your f-stop. To know exactly where you have to focus to bring everything within acceptable focus, you can use an app on your cell phone called Depth of Field Calculator. It can be found, for example, in the free Kodak Cinema Tools app. A very interesting and important feature of lens is bokeh. Bokeh is the way a lens renders out-of-focus objects. It has to do with lens design and aperture shape. You can see bokeh in many a movie, typically in night scenes with blurred points of light. These are often circular, but can have other shapes, such as triangles. You can also get what is called swirly bokeh with some of the vintage still photography lenses. Focus is critical when shooting on film. Since you don't have immediate feedback, as is the case with modern digital. For run and gun situations, meaning little to no time for preparation, you might prefer a zoom lens. As mentioned earlier, good zoom lenses maintain the focus throughout the zoom range. When you zoom in, your depth of field becomes narrower, which allows for easier focusing. Then, you simply zoom out to obtain the desired framing. If you have more time, you should also fully open your diaphragm to further narrow down your depth of field and nail the focus. For narrative films, I recommend tape measuring for shorter distances and therefore more critical focus. A very specialized type of lenses are anamorphic lenses. These lenses typically squeeze the image horizontally, most of the time by the factor of two. When projecting the image, 
or during digital post-processing, the image needs to be de-squeezed, thus resulting in an image that is wider horizontally. These kind of lenses were used mainly, but not exclusively, for films shot on 35mm from the 1950s through the 1980s and saw recently a resurgence because of the unique look and feel they create. Some 16mm and Super 8 film enthusiasts also use anamorphic lenses, usually in form of an attachment lens, to achieve a wide image and a certain look. Even though shooting anamorphic is much more cumbersome for an array of reasons, such as availability, compatibility, focus and alignment, it is definitely something you might want to look into. For further information, please check the links in the description. Well, I hope I was able to provide some insight so you know what to look for when buying a lens for shooting on film. Thanks for watching.